Hi there, my highly valued, treasured and esteemed viewers and listeners and welcome back to your channel of choice. My name is Dr. Nath Arwa. I am a clinical pharmacist by training and by profession and I am the founder of Progressive Pharmacotherapy Consultants, a premier virtual clinical pharmacy institute for capacity building for healthcare workers. The Virtual Clinical Pharmacy Institute with the difference where patient safety medication therapy management and optimal clinical outcomes are very crucial and non-negotiable to us. Here, we seek to remain your premier source of crucial tips for high-impact pharmacotherapy services, so I humbly urge you to sit back and spare me part of your very precious time to share with you some precious tips which may prove very useful in your line of duty. Welcome to part 69 of our pharmacotherapy MCQ series which majors in immunology. So the first question reads, Mrs. SMM, a 25-year-old female patient, presents to your vaccination center at your hospital requesting for updates on the vaccines indicated for her. She is expectant. She is in her 19th week of gestation. So my question to you is, which of the vaccines listed below is contraindicated for Mrs. SMM? Remember, she's pregnant. Is it the hepatitis A vaccine, the measles, mumps, and rubella, what we call MMR, or is it the pneumovax, or is it the menactra, the MCV4? I'll give you 10 seconds to choose the correct answer. So MMR it is. Now MMR is the only live attenuated vaccine from the list above. Now live vaccine used in pregnancy or in immunocompromised patients is a uh, avoided due to risks of developing the actual infection even though the live vaccine is attenuated. Now the varicella zoster vaccine is another example of a live attenuated vaccine just for your information. Let's move to the next question please. And it reads, which of the designations in the names of monoclonal antibodies listed below applies to humanized monoclonal, monoclonal IgG antibodies. Is it the OMAB? Is it the Zumab? Is it the Ixumab? Or is it the UMAB? I'll give you 10 seconds to choose the correct answer. B is the correct answer. Now the MABs that end in Zumab are humanized and uh, the complementary determining regions which you call the CDRs uh, are obtained from mice which constitutes around 5 to 10 percent. Now for those that end in UMAB they are 100 percent human antibodies and the ones that end in Zimab are chimeric 67% human and around 33 from the mice. Then the ones adding in Zomab are murine in nature. They are 100% obtained from mice. Then the ones ending in Xizumab are combined humanized and chimeric chains. The ones ending in, in Axumab are obtained from either rat or mice. The rat or mouse chimas, and the ones ending in imab are hamster in nature, and the ones ending in amab are obtained from rats, and the ones ending in imab, I M A B, are primate in origin. That's just a by the way. Let's move to. A by the way, let's move to the next question, which reads. Uh, Mr. J.M.K., a 36-year-old male, presents 
to your HIV comprehensive care clinic for a follow-up appointment after a recent regimen change. He now takes Triumec. His CD4 plus count and viral loads are both at go. He will continue taking septuin cortimoxazole DS one tablet thrice weekly prophylactically against pneumocystis gyrovesi pneumonia PJP. Now five days after this visit, JMK calls the clinic due to concerns following the appearance or the emergence of a new rash that developed earlier that morning. So my question to you is, which of the drugs or and uh, mechanism combinations listed below are likely to be the cause of this rash? Is it a case of immune reconstitution syndrome? Or is it a bacavia? Which has caused an H, which has been caused by HLA B star 57 allele positivity, or is it a case of septrin in a slow acetylator, or is it a case of a patient being on dolutegravir who has HLA B star 5701 allele positivity? I'll give you 10 seconds. To choose the correct answer. So both options B and C are probable and possible in this case. I would like to start by commenting that septrin is hepatically metabolized to two potentially toxic metabolites, which are the hydroxylamine and the nitrososulfonamide. Now these metabolites create protein complexes that may elicit immunologic reactions or may be directly cytotoxic. Now since JMK is HIV positive, he may have a significantly higher risk of allergic response to cotrimoxazole, septrin or bactrim. Now abacavir requires HLA testing prior to initiation, and I would like to emphasize that patients with positive HLA B star 5701 alleles are at risk of hypersensitivity reactions that can be fatal in the extreme circumstances. I would like to add that dolutegravir doesn't require HLA testing at all prior to initiation, and I would also like to add that iris occurs when patients with undetectable CD4 or very low levels are initiated on heart, highly active antiretroviral therapy, eliciting massive immune responses which can present similar to either sepsis or shock. I would like to also add that HIV positive patients or the slow acetylators are at a high risk of immune mediated reactions to cotrimoxazole, to septrin or bactrim. That's just a by the way for your information. So that makes answers B and C correct. Let's move to the next question. And it reads Mr. ASM, a 26 year old male patient, presents to your accident at the emergency department following an acute allergic reaction. He was stung by a wasp 20 minutes prior to his arrival at your accident and emergency department. He has a significant edema and an erythema at the site of the sting. And uh, he informs you he administered his epinephrine auto-injector 10 minutes prior to his presentation at your hospital. And uh, this patient is asthmatic and he reports prior anaphylaxis to wasp stings. So my question to you is, which of the medications listed below is the most appropriate to administer to Mr. ASM now now? Would you choose to administer prednisone, methylprednisolone, fludrocortisone 
or would you administer bometasone? I'll give you 10 seconds to choose the correct answer. would inject methylprednisolone. Now we know that corticosteroids with primarily glucocorticoid properties or effects should be administered to patients with acute allergic reactions. Now the purpose of the corticosteroids is to prevent biphasic or recurrent anaphylaxis when the effect of epinephrine has worn off. Now of the available options listed above, Methylprednisolone is the most appropriate due to its relative glucocorticoid potency and it also has low mineralocorticoid effect and it, uh, the other advantage is that it is the ability to administer it IV. Now I would like to emphasize that fludrocortisone is a potent mineralocorticoid which is inappropriate for the treatment of acute allergic reactions. I'd also like to add that while prednisone can be used for the management of allergic reactions, uh, in this particular case where anaphylaxis may be present, an entero absorption of oral medication, in my opinion, may be compromised due to what we call shunting of blood away from the gut. Now, in addition, uh, patients with anaphylaxis can experience what we call gut edema, which can result in vomiting. And I would also like to add that uh, oral steroids can cause nausea, which would only further compound this potential problem that we have at hand, so I would not settle for oral prednisone. And I would like to also add that mometasone isn't available as either an IV or an oral product. So it isn't an appropriate uh, drug form or choice for this particular indication that we are faced with. Let's move to the next question, please. And it reads, which of the statements listed below is accurate with regard to the human papilloma virus, which we abbreviate as HPV vaccine? Is it true that all the HPV vaccines at least cover against HPV type 16? Or is it true that Severix is known as HPV 4 or 4 valent? Or is it true that uh, it's recommended in adults below the age of 45 years? Or is it true that it is recommended to be administered by sub-Q injection? I'll give you 10 seconds to choose the correct answer. So both answers A and C are correct. All the HPV vaccines at least cover against HPV type 16 and uh, this vaccine is recommended in adults below the age of 45. I would just like to add that the papilloma virus vaccine is an inactivated viral vaccine which is administered by IM injection and it is approved for use in adults who are aged 40 or below. Now only the formulation marketed under the trade name Gardasil covers the nine main types of HPV, which are 6, 11, 16, 18, 31, 33, 45, 52, and 58. Whereas the brand name Severix uh, covers only two types, which are 16 and 18. Just for your information, it has a narrower spectrum. Now, the HPV vaccine covers the types of HPV that can cause genital warts and cervical cancer. I would like to emphasize the fact that uh, type 16 and 18 are the two types that cause most of cervical cancer cases. 
So that's just for your information. The correct answers here are A and C. The next question reads, which of the vaccines listed below is contraindicated in a patient taking low-dose prednisone and uh, mycophenolate morphetil following a renal transplant, which he underwent six months ago? Is it hepatitis A vaccine? Is it the meningococco vaccine? Is it the Zostavax? Or is it the Pneumovax? I'll give you 10 seconds to choose the correct answer. Zostavax it is. Now Zostavax, which is the Zostavax vaccine, is the only live attenuated vaccine among those listed above. Now the use of a live vaccine during pregnancy or in the immunocompromised patients is generally supposed to be avoided due to the risk of developing the actual infection even though the live vaccines are attenuated. I would like to emphasize that varicella zoster, which is the marketed as Varivax, is another example of a live attenuated vaccine that we need to watch out for in this population. Let's move to the next question, please. And it reads, Mr. APP, a 68-year-old male, is being sent to a long-term care facility by his children who are relocating overseas. Now, prior to his admission to this uh, facility, the facility management tasks you to review this patient's vaccination and medical history and to recommend any indicated vaccines. He has a past medical history of type 2 diabetes mellitus. He is hypertensive and suffers from hyperlipidemia and is classified uh, CKD stage 5 and he undergoes hemodialysis three times weekly. And uh, with regard to his vaccination history, he has received the influenza vaccine for the current flu season. Then five years ago, he received the Tdap. And uh, after lab tests are done, uh, there is evidence he received the varicella vaccine. Then uh, he also received the RZV, the two-dose series, one year ago. So my question to you is, which of the agents listed below should uh, Mr. APP receive now? Should he receive the ZVL vaccine, the Hep B vaccine? the HEP A vaccine or the TD? I'll give you 10 seconds to choose the correct answer. He should receive the HEP B vaccine. Now HEP V vaccination is recommended for adults at a risk for hepatitis B infection such as the HIV infection, patients with chronic liver disease, patients who are currently or have had recent uh, injection drug use, or uh, patients with either percutaneous or mucosal risk of exposure to blood, such as those who undergo hemodialysis. Now we know that Mr. APP also has type 2 diabetes mellitus and the CDC recommends routine Hep V vaccination of individuals with diabetes mellitus younger than 60 years and even those above the age of 60 at the discretion of the treating provider. Now the ZVL which is the Zosta live vaccine isn't necessary in Mr. APP's case since he has received two doses of uh, the referred Zoster recombinant vaccine. I would like to add that the CDC recommends one dose of Tdap, which Mr. APP has already received, and that should be followed by 
TD or a TDAP booster every 10 years. Now, Mr. APP, if I remember well, received TDAP five years ago and therefore doesn't yet need a dose of TD. Now, the CDC also recommends routine HEP A vaccination in individuals at high risk of HEP A infection. Now, the risks include HIV infection, injection or non-injection drug use, and uh, even travel to counties, countries sorry, with high or intermediate endemic hepatitis A. Now, those not at risk may receive the series if they want protection, but it isn't necessary for Mr. APP, in my opinion. I would just like to add that ZVL is a live attenuated vaccine which is administered sub Q. Just for your information, let's move to the next question, please. The next question reads Mrs. KUT, a mother of a seven month old boy who was delivered at full term via normal vaginal birth without complications inquires from you about the use of the rotor virus vaccine my question to you is which of the statements below is accurate with regard to this vaccine is it true that it can be administered to a pediatric patient with a past history of intersusception or is it true that it is recommended to be given at any age up to 18 years or is it true that it is administered orally? Or is it true that it is an inactive vaccine? I'll give you 10 seconds to choose the correct answer. So this vaccine is administered orally. Now, Rotavirus vaccine, marketed as either Rotarix or Rotatech, is a live attenuated vaccine which is administered orally in infants between 6 weeks and up to 32 weeks of age. While overall rare, there have been cases of intersusception, which is an emergency situation where one segment of the intestine telescopes, in quotes, inside another, causing an intestinal obstruction. Now, rotavirus is the most important common cause of virus-mediated diarrhea that can lead to dehydration and even electrolyte imbalance or abnormalities in this population. Just as uh, by the way, let's move to the next question, please. And it reads, Mrs. EAA, a 71-year-old female patient, is undergoing treatment for a urinary tract infection with cotrimoxazole DS. Now, she takes one tablet orally twice a day. And after a week of therapy, she develops a maculopapular rash accompanied by fever. She stops taking the medication and the rash resolves after three days. So my question to you is how would you best describe this allergic reaction? Is it a type 4 cell mediated allergy? Is it a type 3 immune complex type? Is it a type 1 IgE mediated allergy? Or is it a type 2 cytotoxic type? I'll give you 10 seconds to choose the correct answer. Clearly, this is a type 3 immune complex type. Now, this scenario is best classified as type 3 immune complex reaction. Now, such reactions are delayed onset, typically after 72 hours from the initial exposure to the xenobiotic, and they can be delayed up to several days, and they can persist for days as well. 
An example of uh, the cell Coombs type 3 reaction includes DRES, which is D R E W -S, S, drug, rush with the xenophilia and systemic symptoms. Another example is the SJS, and even 10. 10 is toxic epidermal necrolysis. Now, type 1. IgE-mediated reactions, which is uh, alternative C, uh, can also be called anaphylaxis, and they are immediate onset allergic reactions. Remember that. Now, since this reaction started seven days after initiation of the medication, and the symptoms don't match anaphylaxis, a type 1 allergy is unlikely in this case. Then I would like to add that type 2 allergic reactions are delayed onset cytotoxic reactions. Now an example would be heat, heparin induced thrombocytopenia. So that doesn't, uh, that doesn't apply to this situation. That makes answer D wrong. And then type 4 allergies are further divided into subtypes A, B, C and D. And these are delayed onset reactions. They are T cell, neutrophil, or monocyte, and even xenophil mediated. And the common example would be, for example, contact dermatitis, if I remember well. That's just by the way to clarify why B is our best bet in this particular question. Let's move to the next question, please. Mrs. ZAO. A 67-year-old female patient inquires from you about a new shingles vaccine. To date, she hasn't received a shingles vaccine, and she seeks to know if the vaccine is indicated in her case since she has already had a bout of a shingles outbreak. So my question to you is, which of the recommendations listed below is correct with regard to to the herpes zoster vaccine. Is it true that no further vaccination is required in uh, Madame ZAO's case? Or is it true that a two dose series or the RZV, the Shingrix, should be given two to six months apart? Or is it true that only one dose of the RZV, the Shingrix, is recommended? Or is it true that uh, the patient must complete a two-dose series of ZVL, which is Zostavax, given two to six months apart? I'll give you 10 seconds to choose the correct answer. So a two-dose series of or RZV Shingrix should be given two to six months apart. Now I would like to add that adults 50 years or older should complete a two dose series of RZV which is a Shingrix. Now doses are given two to six months apart regardless of previous herpes zoster or history of ZVL which is a zoster vax vaccination. I would like to add that RZV should be given at least two months after ZVL. Now remember RZV vaccine is preferred over ZVL for patients who haven't been immunized for herpes zoster. Remember that. I would like to add as a by the way that ZVL is a one dose series not a two dose series at all. Now the RZV is a two dose series as I said earlier which is given two to six months apart. The series should be restarted if the second dose is given less than uh, four weeks after the first if it's given too soon. It's written somewhere in the literature and I would also like to add that routine vaccination for herpes uh, is recommended for patients over the age of 50 with uh, a two dose series of RZV. Now adults over the age of 60 should receive two doses of RZV or one dose of ZVL.
L. And I would like to remind you that shingles can result in post-hepatic neuralgia, which is very painful. Hence, it is important to vaccinate these patients, just as a by the way. Let's move to the next question. Mr. STT, a 68-year-old male patient, inquires about influenza vaccination from you. He received the vaccination in the past, but read about a vaccination specifically meant for adults above the age of 65 years. My question to you is, which of the recommendations listed below represents the CDC recommendations for influenza vaccination for adults aged 65 years and above? Is it true that no influenza vaccination is recommended for individuals aged 65 and older that have uh, had the vaccine in the past? Or is it true that there is no preferred influenza vaccine for individuals aged 65 and above and that they should receive any influenza vaccine for which they are eligible? Or is it true that the trivalent influenza vaccine with the adjuvant is preferred for individuals aged 65 years and above? Or D, is it true that the high dose trivalent influenza vaccine is preferred for individuals aged 65 years and above? I'll give you 10 seconds to choose the correct answer. So it is true that there is no preferred influenza vaccine for individuals aged 65 years and above. They should receive any influenza vaccine for which they are eligible. Now, I would like just to remind you that the CDC has no preferred influenza vaccination for the elderly or any age groups. There are two main influenza vaccines specifically for individuals aged 65 and above, the trivalent influenza vaccine with adjuvant and the high dose trivalent influenza vaccine. Now, neither is preferred over the other, but uh, they may offer additional immunity for high risk patients. Now, individuals age 65 and above shouldn't receive the live nasal influenza vaccine. Remember that. I would like to remind you that the trivalent influenza vaccine with adjuvant is available for uh, patients age 65 and above and includes the adjuvant what we call MF59 and that one increases the immune response and uh, the high dose trivalent vaccine is approved for individuals age 65 and above and it contains four times the amount of antigen as other influenza vaccines it may be given to individuals age 65 and above but it isn't preferred over other inactivated influenza vaccines. Just remember that as well. And then uh, all individuals aged six years and above should receive annual flu vaccines unless they are contraindicated. And I would like to also remind you that live attenuated uh, vaccines shouldn't be administered to the immunocompromised patients just for your information because of obvious reasons let's move to the next question please mr agm a 47 year old male presents with a past medical history of hypertension hyperlipidemia to the clinic for a routine checkup he currently takes enalapril azetimibe hydralazine and atovastatin my question to you is which of the medications listed below has been associated with drug-induced autoimmune disorder? Is it hydralazine, ezetimibe, atovastatin, or enalapril? I'll give you 10 seconds to choose the correct answer. Both hydralazine and azetimibe are associated with these disorders. 
Now, hydralazine is associated with SLE, which is a drug related autoimmune disorder, and approximately 10% of patients taking hydralazine in doses of up to 200 milligrams or more daily will develop SLE after three months of therapy. Now, azetimib, on the other hand, is associated with SLE. However, this adverse event is rare in the case of azetimib. Now, other drugs uh, associated with LSE may include infliximab, for example, etanercept, procainamide, the hydralazine that I had mentioned, quinidine, and even isoniazid. I would like to just add that uh, atovastatin and enalapril aren't associated with any drug-induced autoimmune disorders. Now, drug-induced SLE manifests as arthralgias, myalgias, and even polyarthritis. Now, rarely, renal and pulmonary involvement may also occur. And it may take several months after initiating therapy for these reactions to develop. However, uh, they can resolve after the drug is discontinued. So there is hope there. And I would just like to add that procainamide carries a black box warning for the development of drug-induced SLE. And uh, remember, up to 50% of patients taking long-term procainamide may develop drug-induced SLE. So be very careful when choosing it as an antiarrhythmic drug. Let's move to the next question, which reads, Mr. SMM, a 68-year-old male, presents to your clinic. He wants the pneumonia shot, in his own words, and informs you he doesn't recall receiving any vaccination for pneumonia despite being up to date with all his other vaccines. So my question to you is, which of the recommendations listed below would be the most appropriate regarding pneumonia vaccination in individuals above 50 years of age, like this gentleman? Is it true that PCV13 and PPSV23 shouldn't be administered to individuals over the age of 65 years? Or is it true that only adults aged 65 and above with immunocompromising conditions with a CSF leak or with cochlear implants should receive the PCV13 vaccination followed by the PPSV23 one year later? Or is it true that the PPSV23 is recommended in all adults aged 65 and above and at least five years following any previous PPSV23 vaccination and that PCV13 isn't routinely recommended except for individuals with immunocompromising conditions such as under CSF leak or the cochlear implants? Or is it to that all adults aged 65 years and above should receive one dose of PCV13 followed by one dose of PPSV13 PSV 23 a year later. I'll give you 10 seconds to choose the correct answer. So C is the correct answer. Now in November 2019, uh, the CDC ACIP changed the recommendations for PPSV23 and PCV13 administration in adults aged 65 and above. And the current recommendation is that uh, people in this age bracket should routinely get PPSV23 at least uh, five years after a previous PPSV23 vaccination. Now, since PCV13 is routinely administered to children, the rates of infection of, uh, I mean, from these strands of strep pneumo have declined, and routine vaccination with the PCV13 isn't necessary in adults above the age of 65 unless they have an immune compromising 
condition, they've had a CSF leak or cochlear implant. Now, I'd like to add that PCV13 may be given to patients who are considered high risk with a shared decision making, of course, between the patients and the healthcare providing teams. Now, routine vaccination with PCV13 followed by PPSV23 one year later was recommended until November 2019 when there was an update. I would like to add that routine vaccination with PCV13 isn't necessary in adults age 65 and above unless of course they are immunocompromised or they have CSF leaks or the exact cochlear transplant. Then I would like to add that uh, Pneumovax, the Pneumovax 23 is a polysaccharide formulation while the Privna 13 is a conjugate formulation. And uh, the younger generation or the new young patients, sorry, need it in order to generate an immunogenic response, just as a by the way. Let's move to the next question. And it reads, Mr. A O M, a 69-year-old male patient, presents to your pharmacy inquiring about a vaccine for shingles. Three years ago, he received Zostavax, which is the ZVL, and he read about a new vaccine for shingles, but isn't sure if he needs another vaccine since he received one in the past. So my question to you is, which of the recommendations below would be the most accurate for vaccination for herpes zoster? Is it true that no further vaccination is required? Is it true that a two-dose series of RZV, which is a Shingrix, should be given two to six months apart? Or is it true that only one dose of RZV, Shingrix, is recommended? Or is it true that the patient must complete a two-dose series of ZVL, which is Zostabax, given two to six months apart? I'll give you 10 seconds to ponder over this question and choose the correct answer. So B is the correct answer. I would like to emphasize, as I said earlier, that adults 50 years or older should complete a two-dose series of RZV, which we call Shingrix. Now, the doses should be two to six months apart, regardless of previous herpes zoster infection or a history of uh, ZVL, which is a zoster vac vaccination. Now, the RZV should be given at least two months after ZVL if you need to boost further. And uh, remember, RZV is preferred over ZVL for patients who haven't been immunized for herpes zoster. Remember, the ZVL is a one-dose series. Now... RVZ dose should be restarted in the extreme case that uh, the second dose is given less than four weeks after the first. I would also like to remind you that uh, routine vaccination for happy zoster is recommended for patients over the age of 50 with a two dose series of R. ZV. Now, adults over the age of 60 should receive two doses of RZV as well or one dose of ZVL. And I would like to remind you, as I said earlier, that shingles can result in very painful post-hepatic neuralgia. Hence, vaccination is very crucial in this elderly population. Let's move to the next slide. And the question reads, which of the vaccines listed below is contraindicated 
in a middle-aged patient who has developed encephalopathy within seven days of a previous vaccination. Is it the MMR? Is it the happy zoster vaccine? Is it the diphtheria tetanus under cellular pertussis vaccine? Or is it the varicella vaccine? I'll give you 10 seconds to choose the correct answer. So C is the correct answer. Now, any pertussis containing vaccine shouldn't be given to a patient who had encephalopathy within the last seven days without a known reason or a pertussis containing vaccine. Now, pertussis can affect the CNS and cause encephalopathy. Remember that. Therefore, it shouldn't be given to someone with unexplained encephalopathy within the last one week. Just for your information. Let's move to the next slide, please. Mr. J. W. W., a 41 year old male, presents to your vaccination center inquiring about a shingles vaccine. In childhood, he had a bout of chicken pox. And now he informs you his 65 year old father had a bad case of shingles. He seeks to know if he should receive this vaccine. He is hypertensive and manages his condition using amlodipine. So my question to you is, which of the statements listed below would be the most accurate counseling point for Mr. JWW now now? Would it be the vaccine is a, an IgM antibody that is given via the IM root, or is it true that shingles is caused by bacteria that is known to live in the nerves, or is it true that the vaccine is recommended for people 50 years and above, or is it true that the vaccine is given every five years after the age of 40 years? I'll give you 10 seconds to choose the correct answer. So the vaccine is recommended for people 50 years or older. Now out there in the market, there are different formulations of uh, the shingles vaccine. Now the Zoster vaccine, which is marketed as Zostavax, is a live attenuated virus vaccine that is recommended in patients 50 years or older, according to the manufacturer and uh, who are aged 60 years or older, according to ACIP, which is an arm of uh, the CDC, to help prevent against shingles. Now, Zostavax is administered by the sub-Q route, subcutaneously only. Now, the Zoster vaccine, Shingrix, is a recombinant virus vaccine that is recommended in patients 50 years or older, according to the manufacturer, to help prevent against shingles. It is also administered as a two-dose series, but by the IM route. So there you have it, my highly esteemed viewers and listeners. That brings us to the end of this video. If this video benefited you in any way, I would like to urge you to remember to give it a thumbs up and to share it widely with your peers. And if you haven't yet done so, I humbly request you to subscribe to my YouTube channel. I would like to promise you all that the best is yet to come. Thank you very much for viewing this video and for listening to it. I sincerely appreciate your partnership and your continued support and very kind collaboration. And I look forward to interacting with you in subsequent series. Thank you very much.